In this video, we will ask the question, what is the phaser representation? And why did it become the dominant system in AC circuit analysis? Consider a typical power system with a generator which is producing a sinusoidal voltage at the power frequency. This will feed a system comprising overhead lines which exhibit resistance, capacitance, and inductance. We also have underground cables, which also possess a mix of resistive and reactive components, and a load, which itself can be modeled using lumped elements. If you put all this together, we can represent the system in terms of its resistive and reactive components. We now ask, what is the most effective way to mathematically solve such a system for things like current using Ohm's law and complex power? In the 19th century, this was done using trigonometric identities and calculus, which quickly became a quagmire of mathematical confusion. But in 1893, Charles Proteus Steinmetz proposed a completely new method for representing AC voltage and current. His method was based on the use of rotating phases. This system would become the default way to analyze AC circuits. But what is the system of phases and why did it become the dominant system? Steinmetz system was based on the rotating phaser, which is simply a line which rotates around a circle. As it rotates, it projects a sinusoidal wave sideways and a cosine wave upwards. At any point, the position of the rotating phaser is mapped in two dimensional space by the cosine and sine functions. We might at this point ask the question, what is the point of doing this? On the face of it, we've added an extra layer of complexity because we need two trigonometric functions rather than just one to represent our signal. Well, it's right to ask this question, but let's carry on and see where this approach leads. Beyond the rectangular notation, we can also model the progression of the phaser using polar notation, which is simply the magnitude of the arrow and its phase. Watch how the phase changes as the phaser moves around the circle. The rectangular and polar notation are two equivalent ways to describe the evolution of the phaser. Steinmetz proposed the use of these rotating phases for voltage and current in power systems. They actually give everything we need to model voltage and current. If the voltage and current get larger, the phaser grows. If they're out of phase, the respective phases can be represented as out of phase. They move around their circles one cycle per period of their respective frequencies. We can even go one step further and make the assumption that we have a steady state condition, meaning the phases are rotating at the same rate. In this case, we can simplify by removing the rotating part, essentially freezing the phases in one place. The information about the relationship between the phases is still there. And if we choose voltage as the so-called reference phaser at zero degrees, the respective phase of the current is automatically the power factor angle, which is the difference in phase between the voltage and current. This is called angle notation, and it's the standard way of representing voltages and currents in steady state power system analysis. It always confused me as a student to see that current can be expressed in rectangular notation. So what does 64 minus J 37.5 actually mean? Well, if you keep this mental model of a frozen phaser with voltage as the reference, it starts to make a bit more sense. But we still haven't answered the basic question. What advantage does this extra complexity give us? After all, we can always return to describing our voltages and currents as just a single sinusoidal function. What do we gain by essentially mapping these variables to two trigonometric functions? Well, the answer should become clear when we look at an example and we start to factor in impedance. Let's say we have a voltage source and a simple series resistive inductive circuit, and we can vary each one of these parameters and keep an eye on the way the voltage and current phases are changing. We can increase the voltage. 
decrease the resistance, decrease the inductance, and we notice that the relationship between voltage and current is affected by the mix of resistance and inductance. When the resistance is high compared to the inductive reactance, the phase of the current is small. When the inductive reactance is high compared to the resistance, the phase is larger. And this brings us to the first major advantage of using the phasor representation. The relationship between the voltage and current phases can be intuitively linked to the impedance of the system. Incredibly, if we represent the impedance as a complex number, with the real part representing the resistance, and the imaginary part representing the reactants, the resulting polar representation gives us the simplest possible way to relate voltage and current. In fact, being in phasor form hugely simplifies the calculation of Ohm's law because it's simply the division of a phasor, which is the voltage, by a complex constant. Remember, impedance itself is not a phasor, but it is a complex quantity, and its amplitude and phase will determine the relationship between the voltage and current phases. In simple terms, the absolute value of the impedance is the ratio of the voltage to current phases. And the phase of the current relative to voltage is simply the negative of the phase of the impedance. So the extra complexity of expressing voltage and current as two trigonometric functions now begins to make sense because now division, the calculation of Ohm's law, becomes incredibly trivial, especially in polar notation. So system impedance can be treated as the relationship between the voltage and current phases. And even when the impedance becomes net capacitive, this approach continues to work, except now the power factor angle begins to lead and the impedance angle goes negative. Note that the reactance in a net capacitive impedance is negative because the reactance is negative. And this means the current will begin to have a positive angle in relation to the voltage. And this is because of the simplified way we can do the calculation. You simply divide the magnitudes and then you take away the angle of the denominator from the numerator. This is the beauty of using phases. The calculations are extremely simple. It's incredible how the complicated behavior of a power system can be reduced to two simple numbers, the resistance and the net reactance. Of course, in a real system, there will be many of these elements, each with a mix of resistance, inductance, and capacitance. But what we show here is how you can combine these components into one single part. And this fully models the relationship between voltage and current in an AC system. And when you use phases, the calculations become as trivial as they can possibly be.